Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we're going to talk about weight loss. It's one of the most important topics to talk about for all of us cyclists. And of course, we have Alex Larson from Alex Larson Nutrition with us to talk about it today. We bring in the heavy guns when, we, uh, when we're talking <laughs> about this stuff, right? <laughs> so um, Alex, it's good to have you with us. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to learn from races. Ivy and I raced this past weekend, but we're going to talk about it at the end. We're going to get to your questions first. But first, a correction. I said something wrong in the last episode, and Johan was kind enough to point it out. Johan sent a no note, and he did that at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Uh, you can submit all your questions there. So just a note on respiratory terminology at 17 minutes and 10 seconds from a previous episode. Inspiration is air flowing into the lungs. Expiration is air leaving the lungs. Both are parts of respiration. Hope you can clarify on next week's podcast. Thanks. And I incorrectly said in brain fog, I said that, uh, respiration was throwing air out of your lungs instead of expiration. So thank In you. inspiration is also watching Jonathan or Ivy descend. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 Nate, thank you. Yeah. Very kind. <laughs> very kind. Cause I'm like, <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's good. I liked it. All right. Tom says, Hey guys, I recently did my first road race in about 15 years. Trainer road has definitely played a large role in refinding my love of cycling. So thanks a lot. That's cool because we get a lot of people that say that like, you know, it's made me faster or it's, you know, helped me achieve PRs, world championships. Even we have athletes doing that, but this is an important thing of refining your love for cycling. And, uh, I think a lot of people always think like intervals and love of cycling can't coexist. I beg to differ. That's what I love about cycling. So, uh, pretty cool. Uh, so Tom says, my question is about timing weight loss. I have a three day stage race, which I'm entering in September and which will likely be my a event for the year. I'm 194 centimeters and 91 kilos at the moment, but would like to be around 80 kilograms for the race. That's a good chunk. 11 kilograms of uh, body weight loss is a big chunk of weight to lose. So should I aim to progressively lose weight right up until the event, or is it better to finish the weight loss a month before and hold it? I ask because to me, if I continue to be in a caloric deficit until the race, maybe that could harm my performance. I'd appreciate your thoughts. Cheers from Tom. Alex, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I would definitely, um, not try to continue losing weight right up until the event. Like first and foremost, that's, um, would be detrimental to his performance, especially for a three day stage race. Like that's a that's a big endurance event. Um, and even intentionally trying to lose weight a month out, I would probably discourage that as well. Cause, um, as soon as athletes get into that, like race specific training, especially when their training volume will start to peak, um, I hands down usually recommend that the priority is fueling for performance and your health. Because when athletes are trying to lose weight during that high volume training, there's a few things that are going to be issues. You're going to be putting yourself at risk for injury, which is going to put you out of the race entirely. Potentially you're going to be putting yourself at risk for burnout because those training sessions are just going to feel like trash. You're going to be right in the struggle bus. It's not going to be enjoyable. Um, and then honestly, that weight loss is probably going to plateau or taper off anyways, just due to that stress response of your body being under fueled and thus overtrained. So with most of athletes going through that like heavier training period, I focus on fueling more, fueling better consistently. Usually we continue, continue to see their power and, um, you know, just their performance increase. And oftentimes we will continue to see some like steady and slow weight loss, um, without the actual dieting. Um, some of them are eating more than ever. And we had one guy who started with us in January. He's down like 15 pounds or that's like six to seven kilos, um, just in a three, four months time and definitely not prioritizing a calorie deficit. So just keep that in mind as you're getting into training is that we're not supposed to be at a long-term calorie deficit anyways. And when you're getting into those peak training, it's going to backfire versus offering you any real benefit. Alex too, don't people usually when they try to lose weight, especially cyclists, they cut out carbs. And if you can combine that with high like training volume, what happens? Yeah. Um, basically you are going to see your performance decrease. You're not going to get those like physical adaptations cause you're not able to train how you're supposed to be. Um, your energy levels throughout the day are going to be impacted. So you might get through the workout just fine, but the rest of the day you're going to feel like 
just garbage. You're going to want to nap. You're not going to be as active as you are. You're not going to be a very functional adult. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. Like most of us, we are, we have families, we have jobs. And so you still need to do other things other than training as well. Um, and, you know, you're not going to see like the power output increases that you're wanting to, to get to those stage races and be able to like have that strength later on at the end of each stage. Tom also, he's, uh, what, about six, three and a half, six, four, 200 pounds. That's, I mean, that's not a overly big person. I mean, it's a big person, but not for his, his weight. And he wants to get down to 176, Ooh. like 176, wow. six, four. That's, I'm, I mean, that's so light that I would think that he was, he could be losing some power and maybe yeah. some speed also. Like that's probably not, a, what, what do you think an ideal weight would be? Or like what range for someone who's like six, three? Um, oh, for, I mean, it depends on the athlete and their, you know, just natural body frame size. But I mean, I, let me give you a story. So we had a triathlete that came to us, um, very, very, um, body composition focused, um, wanting to qualify for the world championships in Nice at the end of the year. And his coach had given him a, had given him a goal of like 160 pounds. And we looked at him and his body composition. We're like, you're going to have to lose muscle mass in order to get to that number. Like, where did he come up with that number? And so instead we just focused on fueling him. Well, he did lose some weight, um, but he just did Ironman Tulsa and he got his spot. And, Amazing. you know, that's, that's incredible to be able to do that and still feel good about, you know, the weight that you're at. So, I mean, I think there's, a conversation you have to have with yourself in terms of like, what's a healthy, maintainable body weight for myself that's going to allow me to perform really well and easy to maintain throughout my season and even in the off season too. Ivy, have you, uh, have you set like, this is where I need my weight to be goals as a cyclist. And has that ever worked out for you in a more beneficial way than focusing on performance? Cause I'm looking oh, back, I have totally done that. I mean, like 143 <laughs> yeah. pounds. I remember at one point I got down to below 140 pounds and that was like, and in my mind, that was the thing that I needed to perform well. And looking back, <laughs> it's never played out. Yeah. It's never been beneficial. And actually when Alex was just talking, I was wondering if it's a toxic trait that I like have no idea what I weigh right now. I like, I haven't stepped on a scale in months could be. 135 could be 145 could be 150 who knows like I really just can't focus on that anymore um especially when I have a pretty different body composition than a lot of other female bike racers I feel like I'm quite a bit taller than most of them and so when I learn about what other athletes weigh like um like I was riding with Sophia in Tucson and she was talking about her weight a little bit. And I had to just for a second be like, la, 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 I can't hear you. Cause she's so much smaller <laughs> than me. And so I can't make that comparison. So, um, no, it's never been beneficial for me to fixate on one number. Um, especially the kind of writer I am, I really need to focus on trying to be as powerful as I can. Um, and as soon as I try to fixate on weight, I really do, uh, or had lost, a lot of muscle and a lot of power. So that's not something that I fixate on or have this like goal number in mind. I'm just trying to not bonk on really long rides and be as fast as I can, you know? Yeah. That's consistent. What I see with a lot of top performers too, like the, they, they aren't uh, from the outside in, we all focus like watching the tour de France. It's like, Ooh, what's their Watt KG going up on two this year, you know? And everybody kind of like focuses in on that. And, um, and I, I don't know, Perhaps we just have a different perspective. I wonder if Pogacar is just looking at like, like how much power can I do, you know, and just mm -hmm. trying to fuel the work. Who knows? I also, uh, Tom, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a tall guy. I'm six, six and <laughs> I raced faster at, um, one ninety than one eighty, And I had a higher watt per kg at one ninety than one eighty. And I, I did Leadville back in like 2017 at one eighty. I was look at pictures. I was so skinny. Uh, and then I lifted some weights and focused on power and my FTP was I don't know, 50 Watts higher or something like that, like so much better. So not just on the climbs, but everywhere else in racing way faster. And I used to get creamed in crits, like local crits, right. At like 180 pounds, but 190, I could, I did pretty well. Uh, yeah. So I, take that. Alex asking for a friend. This is a three day stage race. I may or may not have uh, know of somebody 
uh, asking for a friend who in the middle of a three day stage race also decided to eat an ahi tuna salad at night because they got dropped on the climb the day before <laughs> advisable or no gotta lose that weight <laughs> oh my God. that was me that was me <laughs> I, I, you this down. <laughs> I like yeah i got dropped on a climb and then at dinner that night i was like i better get the lightest thing possible i gotta lose a lot of weight and i you wouldn't believe what my performance was like the next day <laughs> so it's i was trash <laughs> oh <you> yeah <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i was no. so flat i had absolutely nothing and then yeah. I was so starved that I ate a ton of food. And then the next day I did a fan, I did much better. So, mm -hmm. um, I could yeah. see that though mindset in the middle of a stage race and you could say, well, if I eat carbs, my body's going to like just burn carbs tomorrow and I gotta be fat adapted. So I gotta yes. eat like just this and I'm going to lose more weight. I'm going to be like a pound lighter tomorrow. Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. That's going to be the thing to make us so yep. like drop everyone on the climbs. That <laughs> was my mindset. Exactly right. Nate. Like it's, it's not illogical. It's logical, but but why is it wrong? I guess Alex, like <laughs> even though it's logical. Yeah, I I mean, it's so easy just in the athlete world, we get just bombarded and conditioned to have this like diet culture mentality of like lighter is faster, but you have to kind of shift to this like I'm in season, I need to fuel well and I need to focus on power and I need to focus on feeling my best and feeling strong and just not and you know, Ivy, you said you don't know what your weight is. Like I was talking with my dietitian team yesterday and none of us even have a scale. <laughs> you know, like we, it's awesome. because then you don't <laughs> even have to like fixate on it. You know, you just focus on feeling your best and, and getting your training done and your body is going to adapt over time how it's supposed to be. But if you're unsure of how to fuel, like that's something that you know, you work with a dietitian, you, you figure out what's the best way to fuel yourself in a sustainable way. And that's going to pay off dividends in the long term for you. I am also someone who does weigh themselves. I'm looking at a board before Cape Epic where I did like weight and body fat calipers every day. And <laughs> when and we used to do DEXs um, to yeah. see what like, that's a the gold standard for measuring body composition. And I remember when I was, I was coming back from one of my off times in cycling and in a short period, I lost seven pounds of fat, but gained four pounds of muscle. And now can you imagine if I looked at the sc scale and been like, oh, I only lost what, three pounds and mm -hmm. all that hard work, but that shift of four pounds of muscle and seven pounds of fat, that, that's incredibly like, I was so proud of that and I was so happy and I just continued doing what I was doing. Uh, but I also know some people chase numbers and stuff. I was more like, I was a process person of like, I want to do this all the time and raise my FTP and then let's see the outcome of it that I can measure and then maybe tweak after that rather than there's an absolute number. I've never had an absolute weight number that I need to hit. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, typically with any weight loss and if you're wanting it, when people say they want to lose weight they're what they really mean is they want to lose excess body fat. They want to maintain muscle, if not build muscle. And in order to do that, you have to be, ready to do it for the long haul because it has to be a very slow and steady process. Um, cause if you're trying to lose, you know, what is it? 11 kilos in four or five months, like that's going to be some muscle mass in there too. And you're going to see some, some muscle mass decrease and strength decrease. And I would just, I would rather people who just focus on fueling well in season. And then in the off season, that's where you play that long game and you focus on the weight loss. Yeah. It, and it has to be like performance driven, like you're saying, because mm -hmm. if you just deprive yourself and you aren't increasing the amount of work you're going to do, your body's going to adjust and find stasis, right? So it's going to lower its basal metabolic rate, whether that's through shedding muscle and metabolizing muscle. And as a result, you'll be losing that, which then affects performance. And I know in our minds, we're all thinking like, no, no, like body, you can eat my shoulders. You can eat my arms. You can eat my <laughs> chest. Just don't eat my legs, you know? <laughs> and that's what we're like, if only it worked that way, you know, um, to, to such degree that you'd be able to do that. But there's downsides to that too. Like I feel, so right now I'm, I'm kind of on a long road back to fitness, but I feel more powerful and controlled on my bike because of the additional, I think the additional, it's not a lot of muscle mass, but the additional muscle mass that I'm carrying from triathlon training I feel so much better on my bike at all times. And in terms of weight, I'm weighing one pound more than I was last year on average at this point. So like it's, it's not uh, a significant difference there, but, um, 
I just feel way better on the bike. Uh, power's going up with training and, and all things are good there. So I just, yeah, caution, agree, like anecdotal evidence to back up what Alex is saying. When you try to just like starve yourself, it doesn't work. But when you try to drive performance, cause that's all I care about now. I'm just trying to eat and nourish myself so that I can train more and train better so that I can nail my targets with less fatigue. And if I can hit my targets, not over each them, just hit my targets, but it impacts me less in terms of fatigue. Wow. That's like, that's what makes the next workout easier. That's what makes it easier for my body to recover between workouts. And that's the sort of thing that that's those really good times when training is like going well and every workout you're actually looking forward to it because you're just getting faster and you can feel it. And that's always coincides with when I'm just focusing on nourishment rather than restriction. So. Yeah. And the one thing too about restriction is when you're in that peak training and you're trying to restrict, eventually your body's going to give in and you're going to start binge eating. And that can be really detrimental to body composition as well. Mm -hmm. So then you're in this like weird roller coaster and you're not seeing progress. And it's like, if you just consistently fueled well, you'll probably see way more benefits in body composition and performance than if you tried this whole restriction binge fluctuation that happens with a lot of athletes. Yeah. I want to take a poll here who, and like when they do those high training volume blocks where you actually just ate to like everything you could, that you felt good, <laughs> who gained weight or like changed their body composition where they like had more fat and any, does that happen to anybody? Always my fear. For sure, Always but my it never too. has happened. I have zero evidence for actually like for that fear. What to exist. happens <laughs> is you end a workout and you're like, oh, wow, that wasn't as hard as I thought. And then you get like, you know what I mean? Like you get PRs mm -hmm. and stuff by by doing that. Yeah, that's Ivy, my experience. Uh, yeah. yeah, Ivy, did you have something to, to add to this? Nope, I agree. Okay, I ate like cool. thirty five dumplings last night. I feel awesome. <laughs> Training, yes. Training's going good. <laughs> That's what it's about. Ooh, training food tip, by the way. I found one the other day. Um, uh, Little Debbie cherry pies. They're like half the size of the gas station ones that you can get. They're like perfect little jersey pocket size. Ooh, nice. And those things on like long, because I've been doing on Saturdays, I go out and do like, you know, a slightly longer ride. And I've been doing those. I bring one of those. Oh, man. The amount of enjoyment I get from eating that, it's like through the roof. It's amazing. So, um, how many do you have yeah, pretty with cool. breakfast? Sorry, what's that, Nate? <laughs> how many do you have with breakfast? Uh, six. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. uh, yeah, you know me. Um, all right. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, by the way, give it a thumbs up. That would be fantastic. This video, because then other people are going to find it. And if you're listening to this podcast, I just realized this, if we get all of you, well, not all of you, if we get a small portion of you to go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel, we might get a silver YouTube play button finally, Nate. We'll get past our 100,000 subscriber mark. So let's cross it. And if everybody's listening to this, if you could go and subscribe to our YouTube channel, that would be hugely helpful. We appreciate it. Um, so go do that. Kevin's question. Uh, he says, am I the sandbagger? I had to ask myself this recently after hosting or hoisting that accusation on a fellow racer, then finishing the race as his closest rival. I'm racing cat two and cross country in the dad's age group of 50 to 59. And after a couple disappointing years at the bottom, um, bottom left of the Dunning Kruger scale, it seems I may be improving as a racer. Despite my advanced age, I only had three full years under my belt before this season. After getting dropped hard last year during one of the regional races by a former national champion, I claimed sandbaggery on his part. But a couple weeks ago, I lined up next to that same racer and beat him in the short track, then equaled his pace for the first quarter of the race on Sunday until we both had to turn around because of a missed turn. I was then able to keep the same pace on the rest of the way through that course. Um, there was a significant gap when we got back on the course. So now I have to wonder if I'm standing in the way of some other racers cat to glory. I plan to finish the series where I'm at, but thinking it's time for me to bump up categories next year. What's a good rule for moving up and cross country? I imagine road and other disciplines might be different. Uh, Ivy, what say you? We, uh, yeah, what say you? <clears throat> I don't know uh, if the distinction between like XC and road and other disciplines, I don't really know if it is relevant because the only way the answer to this question and my sandbagging would be yes, is if they're winning every single race by a little or a lot in their category. And there's an option to move up a category. You know, if they would have said, 
I'm winning every race and people are getting pissed off at me. Am I sandbagging? Yes. Um, but it, it doesn't really sound like that's the case. And it sounds like only last year, or even earlier this year, you weren't doing great. So no, you're not sandbagging. Give yourself a chance to really learn how to really win races and perform well before you move up to a different category. If you're consistently getting even second or third, you're still not sandbagging. Like really learn how to win and learn what that feels like and learn how to practice that before you upgrade. I would Maybe. say only if the top, if this national champion beats everyone by 20 minutes and you beat everybody by 19 minutes and it's an hour course, <laughs> then maybe both you should move up. There's something, there's something in there, but I don't think he's even, uh, has he podiumed yet? Like, I don't, it sounds I don't, like I don't, now at this point, but boy, it sounds like, like a one, no, it sounds like a one race. He kept up with the national champion who took a wrong turn who might've just been yeah. like, ah, I'm just going to race easy now. You know what I mean? And I've yeah. kept up with some really fast people for a quarter of the race. And then that, <laughs> the, <laughs> the last two th or three quarters, uh, they, they got me hard. And also, um, it's a, it's about a challenge thing too. And what I do is I look at the times of the faster field and see how I would compare inside of those. And you use Strava laps or something like that, because if you, if you're getting like even one, two, three, but in the, in the cat one, you would get last place by a lot. I would not move up yet. Cause it's just going to be no fun. Uh, you can, it's going from competitive or not, but if you're in the middle, like of the cat one stuff, I think that's, that's still pretty fun to, to move up. And it's always a. With, with road, it's different, but on mountain biking and cross country, it's always like a battle between a few people wherever you're around. And mm -hmm. that is a race for the finish. And you can practice beating those three people in the same kind of ta uh, tactics you would use at the very front. But in road, it's not like that. You, it's, you have winning a race is hard and it's a certain skill. Yeah. Kevin seems really like aware, which, uh, Kevin, that's like, I appreciate that you are being conscious of like your racing and how it's affecting other people. I think that's really cool that, that you're doing that. And here's the, but, uh, you're in the dad group, you're 50 to 59. There's no, <laughs> like, don't worry about it. Um, and, and none of I, I, I think I see people get fired up about sandbaggers. Honestly, any of us that are amateurs that are not getting paid, who cares if you're going to a national championship and you're doing something like, you know, you're dropping down, and just to be able to win a national championship, you probably know that's not too cool. But even then, if somebody else is dropping down in your race, you can't change that. So like, just you're not getting paid. Don't worry about it. I, I think that sandbagging doesn't matter and that we don't have to worry about it. And it's just fine. And cat one, the biggest disappointment anybody that's upset about sandbagging will have is the pros that are like, well, now I have a job and I have kids and I don't want to race pro anymore. So I'm going to race cat one or in triathlon, they're going <laughs> to race age group. That's not sandbagging either. Are they faster than you? Yes. Do they have better experience? Yes. Do they have more talent? Maybe, but it doesn't, that's just the nature of racing as an amateur. You're going to get a mixed bag and you don't have to worry about it. And certainly Kevin, you shouldn't be out there racing, thinking about like, man, I hope I'm not ruining somebody else's race. That's a really like not good quality that you would have to be worried about somebody else like that. But Kevin, you've got a long way to go before, uh, you would ever be called a sandbagger in my opinion. And even if you were, it wouldn't matter because you're not getting paid and no one else is either. Ruinous empathy. And yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a those, good one. those pros who drop down too. oftentimes you look at their pace and they would get last place in the pro field. Like they would mm -hmm. all be by themselves because there is such a gap between an actual pro and like a retired pro who has a full-time job, but they can also smoke just regular person with a full-time sure. job. Yeah. And that's okay. Like we're not paid for this. Like it should be us versus like, uh, like us versus our limits, whatever our limits that we found before. And if we can push those, you know, and what we can do is we can tell all of our friends, well, that's a pro. So they don't count. So I really yeah. kind of want, <laughs> yeah. that's what we did. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right? actually. They had a, they had an S works and I didn't. So like, that is why. <laughs> so that person's Ejected. Yeah. They had carbon wheels ejected. <laughs> <laughs> Levi Leipheimer won this weekend. So I guess I can take him off the podium in the race that I did. There we go. And then we're no. <laughs> no <it's, laughs> yeah, that's it. In this area, you have friend. to you have to race against the Tour de France winner. Who yeah. <laughs> <dropped down. laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good friend. Good dude. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think I don't think there's anything to worry about in this case. Not sandbagging. So uh, if if that's the case, and I know you can't go any higher, but if you so just what go is off of wins. What would yeah, you guys I mean, call a sandbagger in cyclocross? Uh, just like cyclocross, triathlon, yeah. road. What do you think? Cyclocross, someone that is racing 
Cat 3 races and has won every Cat 3 race for the past two years by a whole lap or more and refuses to upgrade a Cat 2. That's the same beggar. Shouldn't the officials just upgrade them too in that case if they see it? It can be hard, but... Are there like automatic upgrades now actually in, U- in USA road. Cycling? There is in road. Yeah. Um, and then in mountain, a lot biking, the, in, in mountain biking, I know that there was. It's one point. Um but it also is up to the officials discretion. I'm quite certain, um, to whether they are going to enforce that or not. There are some like more general guidelines in road though. Um, Ivy, did you ever have to race cat three or cat two? Or did yeah, you just totally. Go straight to cat one. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I totally, you race I tried it stuff. Is that correct? Right. Um, and I tried cycle cross in like 2013 or 14, uh, and started out in, cat four and cat three to, you know, really learn how to do it and didn't really like it back then. I wasn't as good at, at off-road stuff. Um, but yeah, I was totally in cat four and cat three races as a cat one road cyclist and wasn't winning everything, you know? So mm. yeah, that's another one I hear too. Like, Oh, well they're a cat one on the road. So why are they racing with me in cat four or cat three? Because we um, can't steer. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True story. It's different, man. Yeah. It's absolutely it's different. different. It, there are very few people like Tom Pigcock out there that can go and win cross country Olympic and the stage on Alpe d'Huez somehow. So it doesn't quite John, what about you? What do I consider a sandbagger? Yeah. Um, I don't consider a person, I, I differ from Ivy's perspective. If a person just continues to win Cat 3 forever, I'm cool with that. Whatever. It's if a person drops down a category specifically to achieve like a big win or something like that. I would say at that point, then I would qualify you as a sandbagger. How do you feel about people racing UCI races or racing professionally that then also do a master's national championship? (laughs) I think it's okay. Is that sandbagging? It's, uh, I, I will, I wouldn't cry foul. I would recognize it for what it is, but I wouldn't cry foul. If you're 35 plus, I'll go. Actually, I would if they're paid. Are they paid? And if they're paid to be a racer, then yes, I would okay. call that a sandbagger. Alex, what are you? Not paid. I'd agree with Jonathan that if they're downgrading so that they can win something, yeah, for sure. I think I'm we're, the most we're, brutal. <laughs> we're kind of seeing that in triathlon. I think that there are a couple like top like in in Ironman long, long course stuff like some guys that were pros that are now dropping on age group and they're just like, cause they're realizing that they can, when they're a pro finishing toward the back of the field, nobody ever talks about them, but when they're an age grouper and they're winning their age group with like hugely impressive times, then people talk about them and sponsors care more about that stuff. So I do think that that, that is kind of like an item of discussion right now, at least in triathlon, but it's not that common to see in road. Um, them to drop down ivy you seem to have a very specific uh, scenario that you were breaking down with a person dropping down and racing masters <laughs> but i haven't heard of it very often <laughs> so. happens in cycle cross for sure oh, okay yeah, yeah that makes sense for me it's all about the gap so you have that person who won a whole bunch of cat three races if it was all by like half a wheel and we're all competitive like stay there but if it's your first race and you lap the field twice in cat three your sandbagger go up right away it doesn't matter uh, if you're uh, doing a cross country 90 minute race and you beat the field by 20 minutes, go to the next field because it, but if you beat the field by literally in a sprint every time and you just out sprint them on, on those, like stay there, let's say that you're, you're not probably ready to go to that next one to really be competitive, depending on what those times are. There is a weird exception with this. Um, So, and I actually face this right now with our local short track series, it's USAC sanctioned. And the whole point of it is to give people short track points. So then for nationals, they can qualify or they get a really good call up position because short track, uh, short track races are really rare. So it's nice to have a series locally where you can do that. So as a result, I should be racing with my age group instead of racing in the open category, which is open is effectively like anybody can race it and be scored against anybody that wants to be race or race that category but I should be racing 35 to 39. I did 35 to 39 last week and I lapped some of the people in our group. And I think I finished like over a minute ahead. Right. And for me, I'm not going to nationals, so I'm not going to race in that category. Instead, I'm going to race in the open category next because I want to 
race against those 13 year olds that tear my legs off and beat me with them. So, um, cause I want a challenge, right? Like, and, and, and I want that fight in that battle. That's what I'm there for racing. Uh, um, but if I was going to nationals this year for short track, I wouldn't do that. I would keep racing in that 35 to 39. Cause then I'm going to get points that are going to give me a good call up position. So there are some like Is weird situations. One, What's that? Wouldn't that be cat one 35, 39? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's cat one thirty five to thirty nine. Yeah, I'm fine with that because you can't go any higher, and you're racing yeah. your age group. That's that's comp- yeah, that's a good question. Should someone who is extremely good in the third, like who's thirty six, have to race that that you open know, category P one two rather than the masters? I say totally fine to race the masters cat one, go to nationals, all that stuff. You don't have to race with the eighteen year olds. Yeah, I think it's okay. Um, to not do it. But in this case, since I'm not going to nationals, I'm not going to race that because I also like the other guys, they kind of had a tight race behind me. And then I was an outlier. I was like a, a, a distinct outlier. So I want, um, it'd be cool if they could have their fight for winning glory. And then I could <laughs> John, everyone too. To they just go, that's Jonathan Lee. Just don't worry about him. Like <laughs> he's not part of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, John is known very, very well locally is like just creaming everybody. This is a great forum topic. For, I want to hear yeah. what people think in this because it is, it's Tell one of those when things. when you've been sandbagged, like when somebody has been a sandbagger in your category, right? Or when you've been accused of it, because then that's where it brings out the nuance where you can actually have a good discussion on this. Every time I ride with John, he's like, I'm not going to go hard. And then he does. <laughs> I still remember when you dropped me, Nate. So <laughs> You were on a mountain bike, right? And I was on a, no, we were both on mountain bikes, huh? I forget. You're I was on a gravel bike. bike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, Anyways, it was a light mountain bike. I was like 190 also. Really a difference. I know, you were fast, man. <laughs> the hard part about this is that uh, it's one of those things that we're all worried about. It's like a, um, it's like you go to Japan and you're not, you don't know like the culture there. And you're like, what do I do? I don't want to like make everyone upset. And they're like really culture strong, right? And I yeah. think a lot of people are upset or afraid that people are going to be looking at them and saying, you know, you don't deserve this. You're not where you shouldn't belong here. And that's not the vibe we want at all. It should be so apparent that you just smoked everyone. Uh, but also in the form, let's discuss it. Cause I want to see what other people think too. Cause we could, we could totally be off the mark, right? Yeah. Well, and like, uh, I thinks. bet there's a lot of edge cases, like the one I brought up where you're like racing for points in your category. And that's just is what it is. Cause that's what you're going to do at nationals. Yeah, You, you have know? to, that's, if you're um, racing cat three thirty five plus John, I would be like, you're a sandbagger, <laughs> but it's cat one. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is, and tell us for triathlon too, what you think? Cause I see a lot of sandbagging being accused there in triathlon above all. And it's, it's wild. Can like you, do it? you look it, that's pros the hard part, down. right? It's uh, pros dropping down. But then I think a lot of people get upset when, and if you look at this, a lot of the time it's quite common two, three, five age groupers, even one, sometimes one age grouper. That's just like, you know, they're 30 minutes ahead of the nearest person, you know, and there, and it's like a totally different deal. And then sometimes, uh, cause Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it based off of time, uh, in some cases for qualification for, for world championship events, like completion time relative place, to pro right? time. I think it's, it's just, just place. Just place. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get roll downs. Yeah. Whoever's there, that's going to accept the spot. Um, yeah. you know, if the first place in the age group isn't there and doesn't accept it, then they go down the road. The other thing about triathlon that is, I mean, life is not fair. Alex, I want to, this is my vibe on it. There are people who have, well, in general, gifted genetics, right? Gifted genetics people just are always better at the same amount of training, but also in triathlon, because it takes so much time and there's so much equipment. If you have, if you're, you know, wealthy and you have a flexible job or you have a partner that supports you, that is such an advantage over everyone else. Uh, yeah, really. Right. And is. people retire, the, the guys who retire, the men and women retire early, like early forties and they're going against people who are have full-time jobs. That's an incredible advantage, uh, to be able to train many, many hours. Have you seen that Alex? Like you can overcome it of course, but yeah. Um, well with the swim, there's technique too, you know, plays a big role. If, if you grew up like a high school swimmer, like those people are Huge just advantage. naturally like so much better and efficient. I mean, I had one athlete who did her first triathlon and she was the first one out of the the lake and she was oh my gosh you know a, <laughs> she played or she swam collegiately so it was like oh, what would you that know for like? her that was just a piece of cake but then you know the, the biking and the running was you know a more of a challenge for her so there's there's so many different nuances with triathlon and w- what helps an athlete succeed and some and so for me i'm a decent swimmer 
I'm a pretty decent cyclist, you know, when I'm training and then my run has always been the biggest struggle. So it doesn't matter how fast I am. There's those really speedy runners just fly by me. Um, so, I mean, there's, it's three different sports. And so you really have to collectively be strong in all three to really be a, a consistent sandbagger. I know this sounds weird and like I have a simple brain and it's cause I do, but I'm just thinking the, the thought just occurred to me of what it would be like if I was first out of the water, like, Oh my right. gosh, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> you'd blow up on the Sorry bike then because just... you'd go like, you'd pay so high on the bike so no one could pass you. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> it's just blowing my mind thinking of that. That would be, what an experience that would be. I, oh. I tend to always be like the, um, you know, there's like your leaders and then you have your main pack. I'm usually one of the first out of the main pack. That's typically where I sit. Wow. That's with good. The, That's strong. And, yeah. Like I'm a pretty like strong swimmer, but, um, yeah, the, the running is my downfall. I'm working on it, but what's, what's it like to not constantly be passing through on the bike? Like, or do you, do you hold like steady kind of like with the pack then at the front in the bike? Uh, I, I used to be a slower one. I, I mean, just this past year I did a sprint and I actually held my own pretty well on the, on the second, but it was a very small event. Like some of the bigger ones, um, I would get passed by some of those crazy monstrous like people that just put out huge watts um but yeah i mean as far as the swim like that was always usually my easiest of the legs which is unfortunate because it's the shortest one of the three <laughs> we're gonna get to the some triathlon talk at the end of this nate i think you're gonna get excited about it um <laughs> whether for bad or good uh let's get into thomas's question thomas says love the show guys super interesting and the only way i get through my commute to and from work I have a question about your recommendations for fueling on the bike as someone with an eating disorder and in, uh, and as noted here by Thomas anorexia and orthorexia, I struggle to consume enough fuel generally in a day and especially while riding. Do you have any recommendations for how to approach fueling for endurance cycling with eating disorders in mind? Many thanks. Uh, cheers from Thomas. I feel like eating disorders is you can't put a blanket over that, right? Alex, like it's pretty, it's, it's, even though that, you know, like you can drop it into a box, it's very individual. Yeah, it's so individualized. So I really, it's hard for me to even like offer any specific advice, but I really love that this topic is brought to the podcast because there is this like stigma and shame surrounding eating disorders. And we're starting to see more men and women athletes talking about it, but um, I think it needs to be part of more conversations. Um, I actually just attended a book signing event. We had Kara Goucher here locally in Duluth. Um, she's from the area. She's a very well-known U S runner. Um, she just had a book that came out and she, I asked her about, you know, her journey with nutrition. And she mentioned that of all the pro runners that both men and women that she's come across, all of them at some point in their career have struggled with food. And that was, really eye-opening for me uh, because like I said earlier diet culture is just rampant in the athlete community and for me as a dietitian like I've made it my mission whether it's on social media or on platforms such as Trainer Road like changing that conversation and promoting those positive relationships with food because the fact is no matter what size your body is it is worthy of being fueled well. And there are a lot of people that are suffering silently, so I would encourage them to ask for help. Um, but in full disclosure, I don't actually specialize with athletes that actively have an eating disorder. There are some amazing dietitians that do. So if you're listening and you want help, just get in touch with me. I would be happy to get you some names. Um, but my top recommendation is just make sure that you have a team of professionals that are helping you, whether that's a physician, a licensed therapist, a dietitian, those would be top of my list. Um, and I would recommend that you have professionals that are experienced in the area of EDs and hopefully like that athlete community so that they can monitor your nutrition, your health closely, so they can support you throughout your cycling. Because if you're having relapses, you're going to have to really cut back on your cycling to prioritize your health first and foremost. Mm. I definitely I think in maybe 2015 that I was in that. I, this is a language thing that I think it's probably going to piss off a lot of our listeners. 
But I really like the the term disordered eating rather than eating disorder. And because I think eating disorder is like, there's something in me that's wrong and disordered eating. It just, there's something that is I'm doing that's temporary. That's not me. That's just a, like a habit that I'm doing. And of course, it, there's so many reasons why you might be doing that habit and therapy and professionals that can help you do that. But I just like to think of that term the other way around a little bit. Like you can have a, another one to say I did a toxic behavior rather than I'm a narcissist, right? One is like, whoa. One is like, yeah, I did a toxic thing. I'm, 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 I'm going to work on not doing that, right? Completely different kind of aspects of it. The same where you're doing maybe that same action where one is you are something inside of you uh, is, I mean, I don't want to say that a, there can still be narcissist people who are, who are self-aware and, you know, trying to, to heal too that are good. But yeah, I, I mean, just like I, that kind I of I would say that disordered eating and eating disorders are two separate things. So eating disorder oh, really? is a very like diagnostic criteria that people have to meet, whereas there's quite a few people that have some disorder eating tendencies that could actually lead to an actual eating disorder diagnosis. So that's where I would separate those two for sure. Oh, um, so like for Thomas saying he has an anorexia and orthorexia, I would assume that he probably has had that official diagnosis because he's met that specific criteria. Um, but there are lots of things out there that are even like, very common in our culture that we would consider disordered eating. Mm -hmm. And that, I so mean, that those types of things are things that I work through with a lot of athletes. Um, but if they're coming to me and they're like, I have an actual, I'm, I'm in, I'm in an active eating disorder. I'm like, yeah, this is not the right fit for you. Let me refer you out to, um, some dietitians that are experienced in that area. Anyway, I love taking on new clients to our program, but the second best thing truly is referring them to the best fit. Like that just is a great feeling on my end. So yeah. disordered eating is like a precursor to eating disorders. It can be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And my point, still, I'll let you go in a second, but my point still stands of like, it's nothing inside of you that's like wrong. Like it's not, it doesn't define you. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's something that you can get help with and move forward. But uh, just like depression doesn't define somebody is like now they are. I am just depressed forever. Uh, it's something that you're going through that you can work through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just makes me sad that Thomas, uh, you know, when Alex is saying athletes reach out to her with questions that really, you know, need to be handled by a different variety of professional. Like it makes me sad that athletes feel like they need to ask us about, you know, performance gains for, um, such a serious issue. And I know that people feel like we're, we're their homies and they feel emboldened to, to ask us maybe questions that they can't, they don't feel like they can talk to others about specifically. I'm assuming Thomas is maybe a man and there's a lot of like, people don't associate disordered eating with men. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about where disordered eating comes from. And I wonder if, Thomas maybe did try to bring this up with, um, I've totally heard of this, like men trying to bring up, bring up disordered eating with their doctors or a therapist and being totally dismissed because they look healthy, uh, because the doctor or physician doesn't understand athletics, um, or thinks that it's not a male issue also. And so it just makes me sad. And Thomas, if your doctor didn't make you feel validated when you trying to get help your doctor sucks get a new doctor yeah, absolutely yeah there's there's so many stories that have heard of people going to their doctor and saying i have an eating problem i need help and their doctor says well you're at a healthy weight you're fine and just mm. that classic gaslighting right there makes me get worked up. So I, I mean, with those types of situations, you, ha you do have to be a really strong advocate for yourself and your healthcare. Um, and understand that not every doctor is going to know the best route and actually take you seriously. So you might have to find someone that really will. Um, and there are people out there that, that will help you. And it is serious. Like the, apart from performance stuff, the long-term effects of disordered eating, heart function, organ failure, brain function, like it's worth addressing this for your overall health and well-being apart from just your cycling gains, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 
it's highly individual, Thomas. And what that means to me is that it isn't dismissive, but there's a very specific approach that's made specifically for you out there. And it's about finding what that is. And, uh, I've been really close to eating disorders, uh, in my family and everything else. And, um, uh, at diagnosed and, um, it, it can feel really hopeless because it can feel like number one, especially like Ivy, you well pointed out, uh, men in particular, I feel like feel isolated on this, but athletes also, um, feel like initially dismissed because once again, you're healthy, you're fine. Um, so you don't have to worry about it, but that can feel really helpless because you can feel like you're afraid to even, uh, or if you bring something up, nobody's going to listen to you or nobody's going to be able to find the exact thing that you need. Um, but there's absolutely a path, uh, to be able to find that energy balance that you're looking for Thomas, when you're mentioning struggling to consume enough fuel generally in a day, and especially while riding. Um, I assume that you enjoy riding and you like riding. Um, and how great would it be to be, to find that balance that you need so that riding doesn't further complicate the problem. And instead it's just a, it's like a, a full net positive in your life, you know, um, to have that in there. So that's my encouragement is that, um, through following like Alex's recommendations and everything else, that's a great path to go down, um, and to, to search and to find your, your specific solution for all this, I think is a really noble thing to go for. I think too, a lot of people, they don't even realize they think that is the goal. They think like, I should be ashamed for eating like these cookies. I should be restricting this and I should be, you know, I need to be 4% body fat or I need to be sub 10 if I'm a woman or something. Uh, our, our, our culture reinforces that, right, Nate? And as in, yeah, the in the cycling the in, in general, yeah. then in cycle and athletics, then in cycling, it's like this Russian nesting doll of pressure, <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, keep in mind that there's a variety of different eating disorders. There's, you know, bulimia, there's anorexia, there's orthorexia, there's um, other eating disorders that don't fit into those categories that also have their, I mean, there's quite a variety, but I would say if it is a very obsessive thing for you, if it's something that is truly impacting multiple areas of your life, it's probably worth exploring with someone like what's going on. And I ha actually had um, this kind of came to me when we were talking about this a couple years ago, a lady had filled out an application. We got on a call and we're talking. And as I'm hearing from her, she was using intermittent fasting as like almost her mask for very, very high disordered eating, if not like an eating disorder. And I, it's not like I could sit there and diagnose it for her, but I said, I am not comfortable taking you on as a client because this is a huge red flag to me. And I think you actually need to seek some help with a professional that's really experiencing eating disorders. And she was almost offended, <laughs> like borderline, like it was she was a little upset with me and I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm just not comfortable. I don't think this is the right fit. And then she actually did send me a message like three, four months later, thanking me for the, she called it a slap in the face. Uh, and that she is, was working on improving her relationship with food. And she didn't even realize that what she was doing was so harmful to herself. I mean, she said with great pride that she was fasting for, multiple days at a time. And mm. that to her was like, she was bragging almost to me. And I, and I was like, that this is not, this is not something that you should be bragging about. This is, this is not good. So, I mean, those types of things too, it's like, you might not even realize it at the time that what you're going through might be really harmful. So kind of just checking in with yourself and even discussing with your healthcare provider, like, this is what I'm doing. Is this sound remotely healthy? Do I need to get help? You know, those types of things too, I think you should also be, should also be aware about. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to add that's been helpful for me is, uh, we surround ourselves voluntarily with a lot of influences through social media. And if you're following athletes that are reinforcing or researchers or anything else that are reinforcing these, um, habits of deprivation and, um, things that reinforce the struggles that you are currently encountering with food block that, get that, get rid of them, like get them out mm -hmm. of your life and instead find positive ones. I'm thinking of one that's, I mean, Alex is a great one to follow focusing on, on nourishment. 
Another athlete that I feel like is a great example of sharing her journey through orthorexia is Haley Hunter Smith, a mountain biker from Canada, a gravel racer too. She's awesome. Um, but Haley does a great job at sharing how, how she continues like to, this relationship continues to evolve for her with it. And, um, she's really great uh, to follow. So get rid of those bad influences because, uh, if there's enough influence around our lives to make something feel normal, it is our normal. So you have to recognize that and, and make those changes. Yeah. You can um, very easily do that with your social feed where if it's something that's toxic to you and triggering to you, if you consistently are unfollowing those and following more positive, um, body image, um, anti-diet culture, you're going to start seeing more of that positive in your feed as well. Mm -hmm. This happens too with a lot of uh, young men where the influencers are taking massive amounts of drugs. Uh, with the Liver mm -hmm. King just had this where he said, hey, if you yeah. buy my stuff, uh, and it turns out he was taking like $10,000 <laughs> worth of the stuff every day. A week. I, you, a week. A week. $10,000 a week. <laughs> it was was crazy. it 10000 a week? I think wow. so. But anyways, yeah. Yeah. If you looked at him, you could tell, but a lot of people don't realize that oh, yeah. this stuff, like a lot of that stuff is unnatural. He Un said he was you clean, cannot get there. right? So yeah, like you can't get there because all these, there's so many influencers in the male fitness world that say they're clean, but they are uh -huh. not clean. And then two genetics just has a thing where some people just basically build muscle better than others. Uh, and you can compare yourself and feel like you're less than or that you're not working hard enough. Um, yeah. yeah. Or they're Photoshopping or. Oh, oh that too, right? Camera. Totally. I mean, it's. Lighting it's, pumps. It's, yeah, it can be yeah. very toxic on social media. There's a great uh, trend on TikTok where it goes, just a reminder, this is me with a pump and perfect lighting, and this is me every day. And it shows the same person, and they you would not tell that they're the same person. Because one uh. is like just chiseled and jacked, and then them walking around, they look like a normal person, like a little bit big, but like you can't even really see any abs. Where the other one is like, they have an eight pack with veins. It's just crazy <laughs> the, the difference between <laughs> that competition prep with perfect lighting versus every day walking around. But the photos yeah. are only the competition, right? And then they're tweaked to, to what Alex said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So Thomas, I hope that was helpful for you. Um, we'll see if we can put together like uh, Alex, uh, like Nate was talking about there. We'll see if we can put together like some resources for folks. Um, yeah. And uh, guide them to that. Stay tuned to Train Road and Alex's Instagram. You can find us on there. You'll be able Love to you, see Thomas. That. Yes. Big hugs um, from Mark. Mark says, thanks for making train a road. It definitely made me faster. 200 ish to 284 watt FTP. Whoa. My goodness, Mark. Um, you're nearly a third stronger. Um, it's impressive. And, and, and Mark says and. healthier lost 30 kilograms over the past what? year on the low volume training plan. It's amazing. On low volume. So yeah. You're that everybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Love low volume. Yes. So good. <laughs> low volume. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is, well, actually you bring up a good point here, Nate, because there are a lot of people that think that like the only way to get huge improvements is to pick high volume, right? Um, high volumes for like the people who have just plateaued where they're like, I, you know, I, I'm, I've turned over do, every stone. I can do nine <laughs> hours a week, but I can't do 15, right? Because the high volume too that we have is our lots of intervals. It's designed to be more stress. And you're like, I can't do 15, 20. I can't do anything like that. I'm at 5.1 watts per kilo for four years in a row. Like I need to get a little bit more. And that's what it's for. It yeah. is not for someone who wants to lose extra weight. Like that's right. not for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Mark says, what could be the training plan to pick to take on more outdoor rides during the summer to just maintain fitness with the goal of freeing up more time from training with workouts instead of just focusing on building fitness? So Ivy, I threw this one in because, uh, well, you're not, you're not a community manager anymore, but we see this stuff all the time, uh, still, right. Uh, that there are a lot of pitfalls with this one where somebody is training, seeing a lot of improvement with low volume and also Mark, like totally understand wanting to step back and like you built up this amazing fitness. Now you want to use it. Right. And you want to enjoy bike rides and do all that stuff. And that's awesome. Um, there's a lot of pitfalls, so I'm glad that you asked this question so then we can kind of guide you through it. What, what do you think, Ivy? Uh, why does Mark want to not build fitness? What's going on? <laughs> uh, and I can understand wanting to go use that fitness that you've built and want to go do like some challenging rides and some races and, you know, that big pipe dream long ride that you've always wanted to do or something. 
But like you said, there's a lot of pitfalls in thinking that means you're done with structure for a minute and you can just go mess around outside and everything will be fine and you'll just maintain your fitness. And that's absolutely not the case. You can't just go do unstructured. I don't care if you're riding every single day, you can't just completely abandon structure and think that you're going to maintain what you've built. Mm -hmm. Um, and so maybe just Mark wants a break from, you know, when saying they want to stop building fitness, maybe Mark just wants a break from really challenging workouts and, you know, or a break from being in a build phase or something. And in that case, um, you can do, you can totally design your workouts to be achievable all the time and doing something like train now where it will look at your outside unstructured rides and serve you something recommended that will be achievable. Um, and you can still do those outside and you don't even need a power meter. You can do it via RPE too. Um, you won't get the same cues and instructions on your head unit when you're doing an outside workout power base. So you'd have to take a peek at your workout instructions for RPE before you go outside. But um, you can still do structured intervals outside a little bit less. You know, if you're doing low volume, you can just, you can still do it infrequently, but you, you do still need to do some structure, even if you're just trying to maintain your fitness, you know, you can take a break from like really challenging, um, workouts and do just chill stuff that's achievable, but you do need to keep doing structure. Yeah. But this, there's a myth out there that absolutely exists that I can like put the hay in the barn and then I'm good for the year, but the hay is it's getting depleted every day, right? Like that's like, <laughs> that's like what happens. You have to keep putting hay in the barn. I know that sayings typically, you know, athletes use that just before a goal event. And in that case, yes, right. You're trying to shed fatigue and that sort of stuff. And you might even lose a bit of fitness as you get ready for an event, but your performance will get better. That's the whole point of that. I, I view this in terms of what Mark's trying to do here. Mark wants to go out and ride and rip and have fun. It seems like, uh, with this new fitness, it's like a new toy that you got and you want to play with it. Right. So, um, and in those cases, I really like Ivy's suggestion, Mark of either you use, you continue to follow your low volume plan, but you use alternates to make it like 30 minute versions and you just do them outside and you do like easy stuff, knowing that you, if your training stress overall is dropping, you're likely going to see some sort of drop in fitness over time. It's going to happen. Uh, but the big thing that you'll have to watch out for is these outside rides that you'll be doing that are unstructured. They had way more stress than we think we tell ourselves that like we're going with our friends and it's going to be an easy ride. I don't know, especially Mark, I assume that you're a male. I don't know of any dudes that go out and ride easy with each other. Uh, when they say they're going to go out and ride, <laughs> like, John, you ride easy with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just riding Except hard. You're on your e-bike. <laughs> it's really <laughs> fast. Um, but it just doesn't happen, man. Like you hit a climb or you see a, st a sign and that's why we ride bikes. We like to do that. You know, we like to race with each other and, and have fun. Like we did it when we were kids and we still do it as adults. It's just what we like to do. So rather than feeling bad about that, that's not what I'm advocating for. I'm advocating for you to comprehend and anticipate how fatiguing that stuff will be. It's likely more than you think, because here's the common scenario. Nate, you've, you've seen this on the forum. Uh, I, you know, I do low volume and I'm adding in these outdoor rides and the training's the problem. It's making me slower. Like I'm not getting faster. I'm feeling fatigued. The workouts are too intense. And then when you look at it, it's like, well, Five you're, hour ride you're, Saturday. you're quadrupling hour ride your Sunday. TSS yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, 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 and it's called coffee but, shop ride every time, but it's like, <laughs> you know, and and it's, like, it's but just my average, out. my average power is only this. My average power for the oh, outside yeah. ride was only this. Big yeah, ball, the, right, Ivy? Normalized power is 100 watts higher. <laughs> yeah. The TSS, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, and this is that the danger. Me, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Let's your remove work, average everybody. power. Let's yeah. remove average yeah. power from the metrics. So there <laughs> no, I mean, just like when you say that and you want to like go to the forum, just paste your history. Like if you don't want to make your account public so everyone can see it, because that makes it way easier for everyone to discuss it. Um, Rather than just be like, ah, I can't do outdoor rides. Is it? I think in one recently yeah. we looked at, and it was like, <laughs> like fifth. I don't know. If it, it was at least ten extra hours of outdoor riding. I think uh, yes. with low volume, and I was like, whoa. Yeah, that's so you're doing. <laughs> you're supposed to do like three to four hours a week, and instead you're doing like thirteen and above. Yeah. And so in that case, when you look at just like percentage wise, your plan is com is like comprising such a small portion of your actual training 
that it's hard to, you know, say that that's the problem, but that's going to be the tendency mark because what happens is that your unstructured ride is unstructured. Your structured ride is. So you suddenly have constraints and when you're held up against constraints, that's when all the other stuff in your life is going to be evident because you will either be able to complete your workouts with relative ease, or you will not be able to complete those workouts. And the challenge in that moment is to think that the workout is wrong. That that's what comes up in our minds. But the challenge is to recognize all the other stuff that we aren't thinking about. I'm super guilty of this. Like, uh, just this past weekend, for example, I did like, um, uh, Stetna's pager. We'll talk about that in a bit. It was like a uh, first hot day of the year, more stressful than it should have been on paper. I look at the average power. It was super low, but I listened to my body and I think about it. And that's why yesterday was a very easy day. Right. And today might also be another easy day because I'm, I'm listening to my body and making those adjustments. So you just have to, and yes, we're, we're working hard on, uh, on making adaptive training, be able to recognize all this stuff. We're using it internally in various different iterations and constantly improving it. And it's super helpful, but it's something to keep in mind. Like this weekend, for example, Oh, this is actually, sorry, a really good point. Uh, Nate looking at, and this will change, uh, in terms of how we're measuring these things, we're always improving it and we're always changing it. But right now, if you look at my average power, I think that my average power was like 190 Watts. And that's like an, a recovery ride for me. And it was like four and a, four and a half hours. So that's, I could go out and do four and a half hours endurance at that sort of pace. And I would feel totally fine. Right. However, if you look at the actual score that I got, I got a threshold 9.8 out of this oh. ride because it was like an hour and 15 minute hard TT effort with a really long gravel climb in this race. Right. Where was it? Again? So uh, Stetna's Pater. It's in Carson. It's an yeah. awesome race, like super fun. It's, um, it's an enduro format gravel race. So you chill between the stages and ride with your friends at whatever pace you want. And then you go hard on the stages and they're safe too, which is super cool. But anyways, that's a good example of the average power looking like, yeah, it's fine. It's like a recovery ride and it was four hours long. So sure. That's not recovery, but it, so what, you know, big deal. It's a low endurance ride. Absolutely not. I actually got threshold 9.8 points for that one, which is shows how hard it actually was. We're really bad at recognizing that as people. And that's why we need a system designed to measure this. And that's why we're working on it. But in short, Mark, you got, you got to watch out for the, the fatigue that will be really sneaky and it'll creep up on you and you'll notice it during your workouts but don't look at your workouts. Look at all the other stuff that you're doing as well. <laughs> I want to say for Mark too, it is totally valid. If you go, I went 224. I just want to ride and enjoy the summer and do no structured ride. Like, you yes. know, you're going to get a little bit dude. go for it. And like smash those friends or just enjoy a climb that doesn't like, you know, you're not struggling at 60 cadence anymore. And, uh, you can still sign up for train road and use AFTP detection because it works on outdoor only rides. So that That's is true. something you could still do. And, uh, but also if you want to keep it, you know, it's just the Tuesday, Thursday workouts, you know, you just have a Tuesday workout too on the low volume plan. And then Saturday, Sunday, a great way to do it would be on Saturday. If you kind of want to kind of have a training plan, but not actually do a training plan to have a little bit of freedom. We talked about using like Garmin's or Wahoo's to do workouts, but on that Saturday, you go after Strava KOMs, right? If you're by yourself. And you can even do intervals on Strava KOM. So you could think of like, I'm going to go after these four and the time lengths on these are kind of similar to it. And you ride around that can be so much fun, like so, so much fun. Or you go on a mountain bike ride and just enjoy it. Uh, and then on Sunday, if you're feeling okay, go on an easy ride, go on a longer, easy ride. And then just watch your, um, fatigue on, um, the rest of Sunday and Monday and see if you can do that or work out on Tuesday and maybe you make it achievable. Maybe you cut down the length or maybe you skip it. But you, you can, it's perfectly okay to be a little bit more flexible. And if you're all doing this, I think Alex would tell you too, is focus on that nutrition and the recovery and the carbohydrates, especially if you're going to increase that, do those back to back Saturday, Sundays. And then on that Monday, you'd be like, Hey, I'm not training. I don't need to eat anything or I don't eat as much, but really you just did two hard days and you have another hard day <laughs> or you did two big days and you have a hard day coming up. Alex, like, what would you, what would you advise an athlete on that Monday? If they did a big Saturday, big Sunday ride. And they had a hard Tuesday interval coming up. I would eat like it's my job. Um, 35 <laughs> dumplings. Honest, because, well, <laughs> yesterday was Monday. Look? That's why I ate 35 dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, when you have those big training blocks over the weekend, I mean, first of all, I would honestly do like a trial carb load on Friday to just go into Saturday, Sunday being like in peak, you know, 
position to have really great workouts. And then you're going to come out of those feeling a lot better. But then on Monday, this happens to a lot of athletes is that they'll have a rest day. And in their mind, they compute this like I'm rest day. I don't have to eat as much, but then they're super hungry because their body's trying to catch up from this massive training block that they just completed and their body's trying to recover. And so they're fighting this like I'm so hungry, but I didn't earn my calories mindset, you know, battle. And I say, no, let's embrace what your body's telling you. It's time to fuel. You eat consistently throughout the day. You have nice balanced meals, protein, carbs, reload those glycogen stores, because honestly, it takes like multiple days to reload those, those glycogen stores after a big training block, like a big Saturday, big Sunday workout. And then you can go into Tuesday feeling pretty darn great. This is, uh, yeah. if you think about when you're training, your body is responding to this. So you're going through a block of training, right? Or like a loading phase. So for us, you know, one, two, three weeks of loading, and then you have your deload week, which we call a recovery week, three weeks of consistent training. Your body is like, all right, I'm getting, I understand. Like I'm reading the sign here. I, you are requiring a lot of work from me. So I need to make sure that I am metabolizing food here and storing it away as glycogen. So then you can use it for your workouts. And then when you get to your recovery week, your body is like, Hey, I'm still on that program. And you, but you, meanwhile, you're the one saying, no, 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 you're, you don't need it. Like it's a recovery week. I'm going to starve you instead. <laughs> so like you have to think about the, the long-term changes that are compounding here with your body. It's, it's changing and it needs more nourishment through those recovery weeks. Uh, Keegan has recently mentioned this to me. Uh, he's been doing these huge blocks, getting ready for unbound, uh, not advisable. I, I don't do he, what he Keegan was, does besides he was eagle. talking, he was talking about, uh, he was talking about maybe making his training private before unbound to throw people off. And I thought it's the worst thing you could do, make it public. So then uh, number one, you can scare all of your competitors cause they're not going to do what you're going to do, <laughs> or they can try to do it. Cause it's going to cook them like, you know, one of the two, but he was saying that after these huge blocks, he's, he, he sent me a message. He's like, dude, I'm afraid I can't eat enough. Like I'm trying, like I'm just eating as much as I possibly can on the bike, off the bike, every, like, I'm just, he said, I'm eating so much. Um, and he's like, and something that he has realized is that during his weeks coming in and weeks after these blocks, he has to eat as if he's training. So like, even though he isn't, he's really takes them really easy on those weeks. If he takes a recovery week, he still eats as if he's training because that's how you end up getting the adaptation that you need and you end up getting faster. So this is happening at the top. I think that we have this assumption that like the pros eating is cheating. And we hear all these like sayings that come from old school thought processes from these pros. <sighs> the best ones don't do that. The best ones are the ones that hey, are fueling and nourishing. I do, uh, so we did a uh, Valley of the sun with Keegan and I eat a lot. I've never seen anyone out eat me besides Keegan. And he's like 60 pounds less than me or something. It was insane. <laughs> right. Like yeah. I, I was, yeah, I was, was throwing nuts. up in my mouth, trying to keep up with this guy. <laughs> and this, I mean, he had the, uh, you know, if you don't know who Keegan is, uh, he is extremely fast. The nation's best mountain biker by far wins all these races, Everest world record holder for a while. Like, yeah, insane can climb very, very well. I want to say yeah. too, with Alex point about that Monday, about not needing the the fuel, you know, I think the analogy I like to think of is imagine you just drove across the country and your fuel tank is empty and you're seeing the gas station. You're like, well, I'm not driving today. I'm not going to drive back tomorrow. So I don't want to fill up today. Like that's, <laughs> it's going to be there. Like, uh, your, your muscles are the glycogen is gone in your muscles and it needs to be refilled. And it takes a long time at that gas station. It just comes in a little bit at a time. And if you don't start, then you're going to go back with a half empty tank. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's, you're not going to make it like, you're going to actually end it early and you do that yeah. over and over again and you start to feel horrible and your whole life is bad too. I've definitely fallen that trap. Oh, Everything yeah. sucks. <laughs> Dopamine is low. Like, uh, yeah. you're more, um, you get in more arguments with like loved ones, right? Cause that, everything is harder. Um, reading's yes. harder, sleeping's harder. Cry and all the time. If your sleep is bad. Yeah. yeah we'll do that anyways. <laughs> if sleep is bad, <laughs> oh, then like what happens is. Uh, then your training's harder too. Like it all stacks on each other. Yes. It has a massive domino effect to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. And I, the way I like to think about it is like the training, that's your stress, right? The recovery is where 
you can enhance those physical adaptations and get yourself stronger and have better stamina and endurance. And so you have to think of it as like, I'm going to fuel the best I can during these training blocks. And then I'm going to prioritize my recovery because that's where you're really going to see the biggest gains. Mm -hmm. Um, Alex, you said something too, about a mini carb load on Friday. Could you describe that? Because that is, I've done that before too, uh, before a big weekend. It's amazing. It is so amazing. So amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, it kind of has a couple of different purposes. One, um, you know, if you do like a full day, one low, one or full one day carb load, um, it's a nice practice to kind of get used to like what foods you feel best with when you're carb, carb loading before. Like if you're doing a three stage race, I would probably have my athletes doing at least a three day carb load. And that's a lot of work. And so if you've trialed it enough, it feels more doable. You don't have to really stress about what foods to pick and choose because you've done it before. Um but also when you have big training blocks like that, it just is absolutely incredible and in how well you can complete that training block and then also recover from it. You come out of it just feeling way better. Um, and to me, when you're coming out of a hard training block and you feel amazing, that's a huge confidence booster for yourself to want to keep training and feeling prepared for your race too. So for like a one-day carb load, I mean, I would – look at what you're ideally needing to do daily for your race and try and just do a trial one day, whether that's like anywhere from 450 to 600 grams of carb in a day. I mean, that's a lot of work to get that much in and do not weigh yourself for the love of God, you know, <laughs> with yes. a carb load because you'll see, you know, four to five pounds at least in yep. just water load and carb in that glycogen load. Um, but you feel like an absolute beast on the bike the next day. And you'll day. lose you'll lose that weight over the race too. Oh yeah. Like oh, through sure. um sweating. And the other cool thing about that is that you will have more water and you'll be less chance to dehydrate and bonk mm -hmm. at that same time. Uh, multiple benefits. Uh yeah. okay. Alex, so that four to six hundred, is that is that based on uh weight or do you recommend that for like different well, size people? I mean it's gonna depend on how long you're gonna do your carb load for your race, but it's somewhere in that range is typically what we're having our athletes do depending on the size of them and what they're competing in. But just to get an idea of what does 500 grams of carbs in a day look like? It's a lot. It's very filling. You're going to have, you have to really look for specific foods that are going to be not necessarily high calorie, like high fat and high protein, but you're looking for just really carb rich. So I think back in February, Ivy, you shared kind of what you did in a in a carb load. And I totally approved of all of it. We talked about pancakes and, you know, pancake syrup. And, um, here in the U S we have those like naked juices that you can find everywhere. Those I think are mm -hmm. like 55 grams of carb. So just doing even some liquid carb sources like that can be helpful. Um, rice. I mean, you don't have to necessarily do pasta, but that is, you know, very carb rich, um, sweetened cereals, um, basically you take any like healthy eating recommendations you've ever heard and you kind of just throw them out the window temporarily for a carb loading day because it's all about just high carb, low fat foods because you want, you don't want to go like 7,000 calories in the day. You just want to focus on hitting your carb numbers. I have a, on my Instagram, tr.nate, I have a highlight reel of when I would carb load like throughout the day. <laughs> Yeah. So hard. Like it is it's harder so hard. than the actual training. Um, yeah. another one, I mean, cereals, just cereals are a great one. And, uh, also I like doing air fried homemade potatoes because you just put a little oh. bit of avocado oil on it. Then it's salty. Cause everything else is usually really sweet. Yeah. And I love French fries, especially air fried French fries, but man, you do like, it gets hard to eat hundred grams of French it's fries. It's very filling to, to carb load. It's not as fun as people think it's going to be. Um, so you really kind of have I to get the creative office. and I saw it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> don't, do it. <laughs> don't be having a, a plate of chicken Alfredo or like yeah. fettuccine Alfredo. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, can't I mean, it would be hard for you Nate, to eat a hundred grams of French fries. Of <laughs> no, no, of no uh, travel. <laughs> it's not the, it's it's the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 100 grams of carbs, right? Or maybe it was more. I don't know. I'll have to look. <laughs> I wonder yeah. how much I mean, that like would be in like a... Oatmeal. Oatmeal works well too. Um, or like even like cream of rice or cream of wheat. You can like throw some brown sugar on there, some maple syrup. Like, But those things are really sweet. So if you can find some savory things too to kind of mix and match, um, 
that can be I nice. I, I did I did have one runner. He liked to do sushi, like high end sushi. But I'd said, okay, I need you to have like an extra bowl of rice with that. Um, but the soy sauce, mm-hmm. you know, to get a nice salt bomb in there, and um, some lean protein, but with plenty of carbs in there. Was he really enjoyed that and worked well for his marathons? Ivy and I are big on rice. Um, we like it for for like close to our event because it's also pretty benign. Like it's mm-hmm. not likely to throw off your stomach or anything else like that. It's kind of just basic stuff. So the good old oh. rice and eggs, uh, uh is like a really common thing. Just light on looking at, uh, sorry, Ivy, it was one kilograms of potatoes and ketchup equals 190 <laughs> grams of carbs. Okay. All right. You're That's right. Sorry. <laughs> and, and that day I was going for like 850 and I, that was at 443 total and I had 417 remaining. And wow. I think it was before, <laughs> it was before a, a big, a big, big race, but I, was it, was it I, Valley I did, of the Sun or Leadville? No, cause it was in Reno. So it was probably one of the, like the yeah, road, road race kind of things. So like, were you it, able to do 850 in one day? Did oh, you yeah. hit that? Yeah. Yes. You have to start really early. As soon as you get up, you have to get started because otherwise you're just, you're not going to hit those big numbers. Yeah. You like Leadville, physically can't. Yeah. I tried to do it with like whole foods and it was like, <laughs> it was not smart. How many boxes of cereal did you eat that day? <laughs> Cereal's <laughs> so much better, but I tried to do it with like fiber, really rich fiber stuff. And that was, oh yeah, that was done. Don't yeah, do that. You gotta go, you gotta go low fiber because, uh, fiber just adds fecal bulk and that's not going to be something you want to have the next day. Yeah, that's hey, totally. actually going to make it so that you're at the, you're going to have to have five pre-race stops at the porter potty <laughs> yeah. instead of, you know, just yeah. two or something. It's like, but it's, it's absolutely the truth. There's a tendency. I, we joked earlier about my tendency with that ahi tuna salad in the middle of the stage race, but I see this really commonly, even with like high end pro athletes where it's like the night before a race. And they're eating something that's like uh, a bunch of veggies and salad and stuff. Um, and I know that there's like a tendency and there's pressure outside from that, but you know, your body needs race gas. <laughs> like, Just grab race a gas bag is carbs. of bagels and chow yeah. down. <laughs> I can't Alex, stop thinking about French fries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta go. We gotta end the podcast <laughs> due to personal reasons. <laughs> I gotta get out of here. Well, Alex, what you said about Reese. fiber, though, it actually does add like an extra pound or two, right? You can eat that with a whole, if you concentrate a whole bunch of fiber the day before. Is that right? Um, well, f- fiber is going to be extra filling. So you're already going to be feeling full enough during a carb load. So that doesn't help. Um, but it, Adds, it's going to put you at risk for needing to have some bowel movements the next day. You know, it just produces bulkier mm-hmm. stools. I mean, fiber is great from a health standpoint. It's just not something that we would recommend having a lot of in the days leading up to your race. Especially, I mean, especially for our runner athletes that are a little more sensitive to that because of that jostling motion. Um, cyclists tend to not have as many issues, but um, yeah, it's just something you can kind of help reduce that risk mm-hmm. by having low fiber. Like I said, all the healthy eating guidelines when it comes to carb loading, you just push those to the side for that day and, you and on the bike, just right? on carbs. Yeah, exactly. On the bike, you're not like, yeah, you would not drink or John probably does not eat that hostess cake all the time. <laughs> yeah. No, no. It's like uh, after the big ride, post ride treat as I'm rolling back home. You know what I mean? It's like, truly the, like, one of the best perks of being an endurance athlete is getting to have those things because your body's going to utilize it in the best way possible for performance. And it's enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I keep taking us off topic because I have so many questions for Alex. But I think what athletes are worried about is giving themselves type 2 diabetes. Like I've seen that a lot. Oh, yeah. Like they're. They claim that that we're giving the world diabetes. Uh, I've seen it on the forum. (laughs) So. Yeah. uh, yeah, Because we're not telling people to fast. So. But the AC1, yeah, it's going to be too high. And as far as Mm -hmm. I've seen, there's no correlation between ath- like athletes who train a bunch for endurance and also eat a lot of carbs that then develop type two diabetes, either while they're training or afterwards when they retire I've, anecdotally or, um, research based. Yeah. So, I mean, like, the research would, shows that sugar itself is not the direct cause of diabetes. Um, and as athletes, we are using that sugar in our training. Like it has a very specific purpose. Um, And I think in one of our previous episodes that I was on, you know, we talked about that while you're exercising and taking in carbs, there really is a very minimal insulin 
mm-hmm. in, like release because that those carbs that sugar is getting used immediately it's sparing the glycogen which is what we want and that that fresh energy that you're taking in is the priority energy source to spare the glycogen so that you're not depleting it and uh, you know potentially bonking so no it's not causing diabetes uh, there's many factors that would cause that um you know genetics is definitely one of them but um yeah i would say when you're fueling well, especially with getting enough carbs, your body is going to be much less stressed because that stress is going to wreak a lot of havoc on our body and our health over time. Mm-hmm. So the most important thing, again, is to fuel and feel properly. And that is going to keep you healthy because you're going to be less stressed. You have a healthier immune system. There's lots of different. I mean, this is such a multifaceted thing with health and, you know, being predisposed to things like diabetes. Um, but if you're concerned, if you have a strong family history of diabetes, work with a dietitian, work with a diabetes educator and make sure that you're understanding how your body is responding to blood sugars and monitor your mm-hmm. A1C. You can certainly do that, but the sugar itself and how we're fueling is not going to be the direct cause of people getting diabetes. We also typically, after we talk about this sort of topic, we get a flood of people asking us to advise them on how to manage their fueling as a diabetic. And we won't be doing mm-hmm. that. Um, <laughs> we don't want that sort of liability. <laughs> That's what doctors are for. You work with your doctor and your dietitian. You work with them directly on how to do that. So yeah, I've um, been actually getting those questions lately too. And I said that is a one-on-one relationship with a dietitian and your doctor, hands down. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. We're going to go into Bill's question. It's going to be the last one and it's going to dovetail into like the final little conversation that we'll have here. Maybe not so little, but, um, Bill says, Hey coach Jonathan and team. I've been listening to the podcast for around a year and I've been using trainer rope for around six months. I rate the podcast five stars and let all my riding friends know about the huge value of trainer rope for me in comparison to a riding coach. Bill, thank you. We love you. Thank you for rating the podcast. Uh, if you've already subscribed to our YouTube channel, because you're listening to this episode, that's amazing. Go rate the podcast on Spotify. If it's real time affected. So the more like, let's say a thousand people go and rate the podcast right now, that's going to give it a good bump in terms of search results and how it shows up when people search for podcasts on Spotify. And Spotify is where people are finding like the most podcasts these days. So go there and rate it, uh, please. That would be hugely helpful. Uh, Thanks Bill for doing that. the value is unmatched, he says, of Trainer Road, then says, I have a question about Unbound. I'm signed up, and there's a lot of exclamation points behind Unbound, by the way. Um, and I, <laughs> Bill's I think that's understandable. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I am signed up to do the Unbound 218 days and counting. I've been using the platform to do my training, and I'm feeling very confident in my fitness with a goal of completing the 200 miles under 12 hours. Way to go. That's the goal, right? Uh, is that beating the sun, roughly, I think is around 12 hours, something like that? So... I actually have an equipment question and that is what makes me nervous. I have a very nice bike, but it's a cross bike. I have a newer Trek Boone from 2020 or 2021. It's got nice big carbon wheels, 32 millimeter outside width of the rims and they're 45 millimeters deep. This is great, but as you might've guessed, I can't fit a very wide tire because it's a cyclocross frame. I currently have Vittorio Terreno dry or Vittoria Terreno dry 33 C tires on my bike, which those tires, by the way, would be fantastic for something like unbound because they're a file tread, like really, uh, smoothish on the top. And then they have side knobs that are really prominent and those side knobs that are really prominent are your get out of jail free card. So then like, (laughs) you know, if you start to slide, they're going to be the things to catch you and give you some, uh, some traction, but they're skinny at 33. So Bill says, I really like them. They end up measuring around 36 millimeters or more when they're mounted on these wide rims. So I definitely can't put a much larger tire on my bike. And my question Am I underbiked because of these tires? Do I need to find a new bike quickly? There's part of you that wants us to say yes, Bill. And if you and if you need that, sure, yes. Um, I'm nervous based on all the large 40 to 42 C tires that pros and others are running. Will I flat? Will I be going slower? What should I do? I speculate the folks riding this race years ago would have been riding on smaller tires. Any advice would be appreciated. I hope it. I uh, hope that it is. Uh, I hope it is that just that I am overreacting. Uh, Bill, go buy a new bike. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> you're all set. <laughs> uh, but no, no, you're fine on that bike. I think, right, Ivy? What What would you say? I mean, 
I know you haven't ridden Unbound. You'll be doing the 100 this year, right? No, uh, I'm not. I think. No, I'm not. Oh, you're doing not. It. I thought you were going to. Oh, okay. I was uh, gonna. Yeah, some plans change. Some. Yeah, a little logistical issue. Cool. I'm not gonna do okay. it. I'm. I am not mad about not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what yeah, would you say? Okay. Uh, knowing all things about cross tires and such and bumpy gravel race with some rocks or a lot of rocks and 200 miles of it. Totally. And you know, having a really big tire at something like this, it's not necessarily going to be faster. It's just a little more comfortable. And if Bill is really used to riding on this setup all the time, um, you won't know any better, you know, ignorance is bliss. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's going to be fine. Um, if it was really muddy, you know, uh, I think the story would be different or really technical, um, but it's just not going to be like that. And I think Bill's going to be totally fine. Um, I feel like Bill wants us to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, run to your partner and say, oh no, the trainer podcast said I have to buy a new bike right now. <laughs> no, I'll do that to you 18 days uh, out. We're not, Don't do sorry. That. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, Nate. Yeah, like that's a big change, right? Maybe the bike is totally different position and different geo. Yeah, you could, legitimately hurt yourself, uh, getting on a brand new setup and doing 200 miles on it. Um, yeah. so close to the event. Don't do that. Uh, yeah. So I think that that bill's totally going to be fine. Um, mm -hmm. are you going to flat? Um, yes. <laughs> everybody does. Like just yeah. yeah. Like almost everybody, especially with these. So, and here's the other thing, right? Ivy, if you look at a lot of the tires that a lot of people are running, they're running them for toughness. They aren't right. picking the tire that rolls the fastest because if you, so for a point of reference on this course, I've been running a lot of simulations for athletes, one pound of difference. So add one pound of weight to an athlete that weighs roughly 155 pounds or 150 pounds. And they're riding on a normal bike, add one pound to them. And it's going to cost them right around one minute over the entire 200 miles. So now if you think about that, that's not that much. Now, if you think about how much more comfortable you'd be with bigger tires, sure, you can think of that. But the main thing is a flat is going to take you longer than a minute to fix. And if your concern is that, especially when you're looking at rolling resistance resistance and you're constantly on a gravel surface, the hairs are not split as thin, right? When you're talking about on a perfectly smooth road and the effect there. So I think you'll, you'll be fine. You will be on, relatively speaking uncomfortable to what you could be on bigger tires. Yes but you're absolutely, they're sufficient to be able to get across the line and to do the event. To, so. to Alex's point too, imagine, I bet if you'd one watt more of power is probably more than a minute. And yeah, it's uh, five, imagine fueling, five minutes, right? It's one watt is five minutes. It's almost five minutes. Yep. So imagine now to Alex's <laughs> point of like, oh, I should like lose weight, reduce my calories, which is going to then restrict how many watts I can do on every workout and then rec not recover as much and have a lower FTP. Mm-mm. It, it's, yeah. it's when you do the math like that, it is insane. It's, it's so silly, right? To think of, of oh, that. Yeah. And then on race day, you know, Alex probably scared some people when she said you can gain four pounds of weight, right? Mm -hmm. And unbound, you might start off with that, but then it's going to go away. But the amount of power you might be able to hold 20 more Watts for the last like, uh, five hours than if you didn't, or maybe even more, maybe 80 Watts. Cause you've, you've had that, like when you bonk, you bonk and you're gone. Oh yeah. Uh, and it, it's a two, 30 watt drop, 40 mm -hmm. watt drop. When you carb load, you just feel amazing. Like the whole race is more enjoyable. Uh, your legs feel great. Like they're all big and like sexy. It's amazing. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> they are. The, uh, the, <laughs> the one thing I would say is Bill. So you lose some compliance with your 33s. Um, as long as it doesn't change the geometry of your bike, Check out like I think uh, Canyon or Ergon makes this seat post. That's like a it's like a two piece seat post that gives you a lot of compliance and flex. Like and boom, you've got a more comfy bike at least in the back. Throw on some gel underneath your bar tape in the front, and boom, you've got more shock absorption up there. Like there are a lot of things that you can do while running thirty threes to still have a lot of comfort uh, with with adding that in. So. You don't want to make a change like changing a saddle before unbound or changing something that would change the geometry on your bike and change the fit and thus likely cause a problem. You don't want to do that. But if you can find other things that might make it more comfortable, then yes, absolutely. This is where you want to add it in. Um, one quick note on wide tires. I am, I, I am going to do this tire test that we talked about a few weeks ago because there is a huge 
assumption that exists that a fatter tire is slower. And I don't think it's correct. Like just, this is purely anecdotally speaking in the situation. So I ran a 2.4 at Stetna's pay dirt over the weekend. I was riding with everybody on gravel bikes and they had 42s, 45s, 40s. And we were rolling down a road. I was on a mountain bike, so I'm less aerodynamic. And I was rolling onto these people with a 2.4. Yes, it's a file tread, but it was like similar tread profile to what you would see over with the other tires. So I think there's onto this fear. Them. What's that? Onto them's the draft. Did you like, would pass you pass them? them no, no, I'm to the side of them. I'm not even drafting. Okay. I'm not even riding in their draft and I'm rolling past okay. them. I'm having to sit up and make myself even more broad, feathering my brakes, that sort of thing to not just like, you know, go ahead. So there's this assumption out there that exists that it's just, if it's fat, it's slower. And I don't think that's the case. So I know bill that's irrelevant to you since you're going to be sticking with the 33s, but, um, I do think that's different. Unbound really quick. Wait, I want to say one more thing on this Torino dry. Yeah. I use those as my gravel tire. They're amazing. And I will use my Epic, uh, especially my Epic mm -hmm. cross country bike with those tires. I love them. I don't know about flat protection or anything, but I don't, it doesn't even matter if I ever had a flat cause it doesn't, it's not going to matter for unbound. But yeah, they're great. I like them. Yep. Uh, I think I'm going to do Unbound next year, Nate. Oh. <laughs> the Ultra, right? Or like the extra large one? But... No, no, I'm not doing the 350. No. <laughs> <laughs> Heavens, no. I don't want to ride 200? it. The No. The 200. That'd be exciting. Yeah, I'm thinking of it. Uh, and in addition to that, since I'm going to do a long event, I'm thinking of doing a full Ironman too next year. If I'm going nice. to train for Unbound, I might as well you know, do something big instead of going back to short track training or something Cosmo well. in November of next year. You better start eating carb loading today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> get some fries with Ivy. Yeah. <laughs> ripping on that swim. Yeah. yeah. That's the main thing I'm thinking about how I need to eat. Cause boy, uh, I think Cosmo is like a fast swim for most people, but relative to everybody else, I'm bad. Um, so I need to, I need to figure that out. So then I don't just, uh, Cause honestly, the biggest thing I'm concerned with the full Ironman Nate is I don't want to be out there for too long. I just want to make, I, I, I want to be racing for less time, not because I'm like trying to go for a fast time. It's because I don't want to be out there for too long. <laughs> like, like it's not a comfortable place to be, you know, John, I would give you a gift right now. Trainer road okay. will buy you 10 private lessons of swimming from oh. someone in town so that Ooh. you can get better at this. Cause you are an amazing athlete and you just need that technique. Uh, what if Jeff I, Pearson, what if we do? Or what if I we do, um, effortless swimming, the guy on YouTube, I know it wouldn't be in person, but he is, uh, he's an incredible swim coach. I, I want you to do an in-person, uh, okay. so Jeff Pearson, open water national champion. He takes a video and videos you underwater and above, and he yeah. is a really good coach. And I think you need that in person. You're doing this wrong. And then watch the, he'll do a video of like speeding up and down and then do that repeatedly over a summer, I think is what yeah. you need. It's all technique, like just the drills. And once you learn that, you're good. Here, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go fitness. against that. I have this theory. So if you look <laughs> at like the top level triathletes, they have the most garbage technique you've ever seen like mm -hmm. with swimming, but they have so much power and so much fitness that they're able to carry themselves through at whatever pace they're able to do. Who has garbage look technique? At, I'll, I'll show you so many videos. Look at the angle at which they're going through the water. And then you look at somebody that's a swim coach that's working with swimmers and they're like, mm, it's two degrees down on their legs and that's slowing them down. Mm, this is yeah. going on. And that's meanwhile, you have triathletes literally just swinging their arms like windmills as fast as they can through the water, <laughs> going through it like a 45 degree angle. But because they're so freaking strong, they can do that and they can do it and not be fatigued because they've put in the reps. I, like I, I, you know me, I'm a technician to the core and I probably will never be that triathlete because that's like gross to me to be, to like, just, you know, thrash my way through the water, but somehow do it fast. I, I will be a technician. So I agree with what you're saying, but the top triathletes, they, there, a lot of them go against it. It's there's crazy. also there, there's like the in pool coach who's like training you for like a hundred meters. There's the open water coach like Jeff who will train you for sighting and stuff. And there's triathlon which Jeff understands too, which you might have a different kick pattern or something. And it's about being able to finish the rest of the race and be in a good position. And yeah, there's also different techniques of, uh, stroke, um, speed. And some people do that windmill. Um, some people do low yeah. cadence, some people do high cadence. There's different schools of thoughts, but in order for them to go that fast, there has to be some kind of technique because, or yeah. amazing technique. I would, 
You look at the I'm best swimmers and they, they have, and no, no, I know that. You look at the best swimmers, look at Lucy Charles, look at like all like the really good, and they swim in open water, like not like the other triathletes. You know what I mean? Like, and that's why they're first out of the water. They're incredible technique. But the one thing that I've learned is that so many of them still manage to swim with the front pack. No, maybe not with the leader, but with the front pack with pretty bad quote swim technique. Up open water is a different deal though, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, cause that's what I'm interested in learning is the open water style technique sighting and stuff. Isn't that hard for me? Like I can sight, and that's not an issue. Um, um that's big, but, but sighting though, what you might think it's, I am sighting correctly, but you don't realize how much you're slowing down when you sight. Oh no, no, and that I is get a, that. Yeah. Uh, you're splitting hairs where they shouldn't be split. What I'm saying here is that a lot of, a lot of triathletes are saying that like, I can't sight and that's hard. Like I can't look, I can't view where I'm going and I can view where I'm going. Does it slow me down? Absolutely. Yes. Um, it, yes, it does. But I don't have the problem of like, I can only swim like I'm swimming in a pool with my head down and I can't look up and I can't do that sort of thing. So I can do yeah. those parts, but the efficiency, obviously, I just don't know how to swim in open water fast, you know? If so, if we have Jeff coach you, can we also those videos, can we post those online of him critiquing you? hundred percent. Yeah. Because awesome. I want everybody to learn through it. That'd yeah. be amazing content. And then we can be like, play this with it. Like Maxine cut it up where he's like, I know how to sight. And then we'll be like, Jeff being like, so you're not sighting, right? No, you're taking it out of like context. Back and forth. <laughs> no, no, because at first, what I was told by so many people is like, you're not I'm even going to be able to like, look, yeah, no, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> <For our purpose. laughs> yeah. You're not going to be able to look where you're going and you'll be swimming 45 degrees to the wrong way. And like, absolutely. Yeah. That was true. The first time that I swam in open water, but then I just Sure, at the cost of speed, but you know, uh, I'm at least able to see where I'm going with it. But it's it's kind of a wild world. Swimming, above all, it's so technique focused. But everybody will tell you a different thing in terms of exactly what you should be doing and exactly what you're doing wrong. And when you look at the front group in triathlon, and, and for example, there's some wildly varying techniques that are going on up there, mm -hmm. and people are still able to swim fast, like yeah. you know, with a front. That's group. a true story. Just John, we'll have you just whatever Jeff says, do. Yeah. I don't know, Jeff. I don't, I trust the effortless swimming guy. I don't know why I'm giving him like credit here. I trust that guy because he's taught me every, he's really good. He doesn't know me. I've just watched all his videos and they're really good, but I will trust Jeff and his accolades. I trust you, Nate. So therefore I trust Jeff. Yes, to Jeff, do oh. Jeff. Yeah. So anyways, that might be a long, uh, I already talked it over with my wife and my family about it. Um, I won't go into unbound prepared, like to race at like the front of anything whatsoever. Like, you know, because I can't train that much. I just, <laughs> you know, but, I'll, but to be able to do it and have like a strong time, I think I can absolutely do, but in terms of racing at any sort of front of anything, it won't happen. So I just don't have the time, like mid volume, low volume training is what I'm capped at. So it'll be cool to see what happens at unbound when you're on lower mid volume training and same thing with a full. So anyways, yeah. Last thing, Stetton is Pater. Everyone should do that event. That was one of the most fun bike races I've ever done. So gravel format's amazing. It's safe. It's like good vibes is fantastic. So, and thanks for everybody that I met at the event. It was wonderful. Ivy, I don't know if you met people at Grind Duro too, podcast yeah, listeners, but. I did. It was yeah. super good. Super good vibes there. Everyone like camps together and yeah, it was amazing. Yep. So thanks podcast listeners. Thanks everybody for listening to this. Alex, thank you for coming on. Uh, if you want to go follow Alex, Alex Larson nutrition on Instagram, follow her there. Uh, always sharing super helpful stuff, funny reels too. uh, good, <laughs> good times. And if you are listening to this podcast, rate it with you and share it with your friends, go subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can cross that hundred thousand mark. That would be amazing. And sign up for trainer road. If you haven't already it is constantly improving. We have amazing people here working on it. Um, really exciting stuff. Uh, Nate and I kind of wish that we could talk about all the things that we're talking about right now in meetings. It's really exciting. So uh, it's good times. Stay tuned. We'll see you all soon. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.